مشاهدينا اهلا بكم Welcome, I am Maison Azam. Uh, I greet you from Davos uh, and I will be moderating this session, Asia's Bet on the Middle East. It will be conducted in English at the request of the organizers. Allow me to greet all my guests. From myself, Maison Azam from Al Arabiya TV. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here and this special debate co designed by Al Arabiya and WEF about. Asia's pet on the Middle East. After America started shifting its uh, focus away from the Middle East, and uh, as Mr. Trump said, US doesn't want to be the policeman of the Middle East, economic and political cooperation between Asian countries is seen by many to be much needed in the region. Actually, many in the region believe that it's necessary to expand beyond the energy trade. Anyway, Let's start by watching this video that is, uh, might give us a greater insight about or into Asia's bet on the Middle East and our region's bet on Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to introduce our uh, distinguished panelists. To my right, of course, Mohammed Twajri, Minister of Economic and Planning of Saudi Arabia. And uh, then also Mr. Sanjeev Singh, Chairman Indian Oil Corporation, India. Um, Mr. Sultan Ahmed bin Sulaim, Group Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, DP World, United Arab Emirates. Shinichi Kitaoka, President, Japan International Cooperation Agency, and Mohammed Twajri, sorry, excuse me, Doctor, and Doctor Fuad Hussein, Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs and Minister of uh, Finance, Iraq. Welcome, and allow me to start with Mr. Kitaoka. Um, sir, how do you foresee Asia's uh, economic priorities in the Middle East? Uh, needless to say, the smooth and uh, stable uh, import of oil comes first. And then, uh, uh, but this is uh, not easy. Uh, Asia is, uh, uh, particularly Japan, is very far uh, from uh, the Middle East. So the, uh, 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 you may think that our bet can be uh, rather limited. But actually, the, uh, now the, uh, this is the time of globalization. And then using the uh, low-cost carrier and also internet, the radicalism can come to Asia very quickly. Well, for example, there is a, uh, we are very much supporting the peace process in Mindanao, Philippines, which is a century-long uh, conflict between the minority Muslims versus central Philippine government. And then we are coming into the final uh, uh, stage of uh, success. I'm very much willing to make it successful. They, they are planning to make a kind of autonomous government over there. Uh, also, uh, there was a you know element uh, that took place in uh, Malawi in Philippines again. Uh, also, a very famous issue of uh, uh, Rohingya in the uh, Myanmar. Uh, what about the Middle East? Middle East, yeah. So, so I, I'm speaking about uh, broadly the mm. Islamic influence. Uh, therefore. That can be uh, uh, united immediately. If those people who are frustrated in the Mindanao, for example, they can be assisted by the uh, radical elements mm -hmm. in the Middle East, therefore we have to uh, persuade them to go the moderate way mm -hmm. and to get included in the other uh, uh, respective countries. That's our special uh, hope. And then uh, because we are uh, rather neutral and we are rather far, uh, taking advantage of this distance and neutrality, we can make uh, a couple of approaches to the Middle East. Uh, the, uh, On political or economic level? Uh, or I, I would say cultural, mm -hmm. more so on cultural. Economic, yes, 
political yes. But I'm of the opinion that the, the, the order can be made by the respective countries there. And then what we can do outside is just a small assistance. You know, that's the uh, source of mistakes on the Western countries. <coughs> you know, they, they thought that they could make order over there. But order should be uh, built by the, those countries over there. And what we can do is just assistance. And in this assistance, uh, uh, we, are, we have uh, many programs. And what we are doing very much, I, I think I have... We will talk about that later on. Oh, uh, yes. But okay. let me uh, uh, ask uh, Mr. Singh about uh, uh, this approach, uh, the interest okay. of Asia to, be, to play a bigger role in the Middle East. What do you think of that? If, if we see Asia in general, the three major countries, India, China, Japan, these are the three largest uh, energy consuming countries and these are one of the three largest economies today. Incidentally, all three, these three countries, they require a lot of energy to be imported in terms of conventional energy forms, oil and gas. Uh, the Gulf region or the Arabic countries, uh, they are rich in oil and gas. So there is a natural uh, collaboration which, which has been happening over the years amongst all the Arab countries as well as these three major countries and other countries of uh, Asia. Uh, there had been a cultural mix also because of the proximity. If I talk about India in particular, uh, we have uh, long, strong cultural ties also with many countries. So I think there is a very natural uh, tie of possibility which had been going on. Now, off late, if we see, there had been shift for uh, other forms of energies. But uh, this is something which is very visible, which is uh, very well known to each and every one. But uh, there are a lot of other things uh, which are of mutual interest. Uh, uh, skill manpower is uh, one such thing. I mean, if you look at India and other Asian countries, I mean, there are a lot of skill manpower, a lot of manpower which work in Gulf countries. I mean, it's a, it's a major source of connect apart from uh, benefit, uh, mutual benefit to both the countries. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just give you one more example, like fertilizer. India imports a huge quantity of fertilizer. Now, nobody knows two-thirds of our fertilizer comes from Gulf countries. Mm, in fact, one-third comes from Oman itself. So there are a lot of other trades uh, in terms of uh, uh, technology tie-ups, in terms of uh, other possible tie-ups, uh, whether they might be defense, science. Uh, I think there are a lot of other opportunities which are opening up today. That's interesting. Uh, Mr. Twajri, Your Excellency, uh, is Saudi Arabia is interested in seeing an expansion of uh, uh, the economic relation between uh, Asian countries and our countries to go beyond oil? So the short answer is absolutely. Okay. But let me just rebuild on the oil. I think the real question around oil supply is credibility and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure Asian country wants assurances that when they needed this energy, they got it on time. So I think Saudi Arabia and the rest of the GCC, particularly the UAE, can provide that very specific demand. Not like Iran, for example? Not like Iran, absolutely. Uh, back to the uh, future, if we, when I think about the way going forward, I think if we take Saudi approach to Asia, for example, in the heart of our vision 2030 is strategic partnerships. And the question is how? How do we actually navigate through these idiosyncratic challenges between Asian countries to create a win-win situation where the Asian private sector and the Asian uh, solutions can help the Middle East and vice versa. The Middle East as an investment powerhouse can look at opportunities, investments in Asia. So the question is how do you govern this process and how the communication and dialogue bilaterally between X country in the Middle East and X country and Y country in Asia takes place. Uh, I would like to talk about Korea because we've done exactly that uh, with Korea and we've identified around 50 opportunities. Energy is one of them, mm -hmm. but there, is, there are others in <coughs> digitization, education, healthcare, uh, other solutions in infrastructure. I recall when I was a little boy, Korean companies, I don't, I don't want to say which year, but. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Built actually a lot, of, <laughs> built a lot of uh, uh, roads in Saudi Arabia. At that time, Korea wasn't doing very well. But we took a bet mm -hmm. on Korean quality and Korean ability to construct and deliver. So now we're revisiting that and do more, hopefully, with, with them. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Fuad, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, what challenges does Asia's growing footprint in the Middle East pose for the region in general and Iraq in particular? Uh, <coughs> it is difficult to say what challenges, but uh, anyhow, relationship between uh, Middle East and, in this case, Iraq and other Asian countries, because at the end, Iraq is also part of Asia is important. So it depends on the needs of the country, and in this case, needs of uh, Iraqi society and Iraqi country. But it depends also on mutual interest. But uh, we must take uh, also the political dimension, the geographical dimension, the cultural dimension into consideration. <coughs> so if you will collect all these elements, uh, at the end, uh, there is a need to establish good relationship with all uh, Asian countries. Uh, could, could you give us an outline of the main um, features of Asian presence in Iraq? You see, mm, we have established a very good relationship with Japan, with South Korea, with uh, China. They are very active in various fields of uh, the economy in Iraq. And uh, in India, they are uh, active in Iraq. I must say most of the Asian countries has got their uh, activities inside Iraq, and uh, we are happy with this relationship. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, Mr. Sultan, do you have uh, precise figures of the Middle Eastern investment in Asia and vice versa, or no? I know about our uh, investment, uh, multi-billion dollar investment uh, in Asia, mainly in, uh, in ports, infrastructure. Uh, we are almost in every Asian. We, are, we have three terminals in China, uh, two terminals in Hong Kong, we have two in the uh, Philippines, we have one in Thailand, uh, Vietnam. Uh, we are the, the best and most important port in Korea and uh, in Busan. Uh, we are in Indonesia. Uh, and so uh, Asia is an important market for us because there's a lot of growth mm -hmm. in Asia. And, and I tell you, a lot of time people talk about China and they talk about how slow the growth in China. Our ports are growing. And when you look at uh, the size of the Chinese market, 6.5% is a lot of growth. Okay, when, when we talk about the port, uh, especially yes. Dubai port, uh, what about their uh, involvement in the port? How big it is? And we're talking about Asia in general, not only China. Um, well, uh, I mean, we, we own these ports, we manage them ourselves. Uh, we're investing in technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is interesting, and, and, and what, what's something I want to say, really, to do with the ports, is that the world is changing in the sense, the nanotechnology, the 3D. Uh, a lot of time, people talk about technology, but they don't realize how much it's going to impact our business. For example, in uh, India today, we are the largest operator. We have uh, five terminals, one in Mundra, one in uh, Nevashiva, one in Kuchin, one in Chennai, one in Vaisak Patnam, and very soon in Kalpi. Plus we have all our own rail, rails and uh, dry ports. Uh, the shifting in technology, today the mobile phone is not made by humans. There is no way a human can make the phone anymore with the technology. Sony, for example, they're not making televisions. And I, when I asked Sony, I said, is this made in Malaysia or is it made in Japan? Because I want to it made in Japan. They tell me it's made in Sony. They make the machine that makes the television. So very soon, not only in Asia, you will see that probably raw materials will come to ports for a specific consumer and the product would come. Mm -hmm. uh, to make a television is not that uh, really difficult. Uh, in fact, Sony, one of the largest manufacturers of machines that make television, they sell them to China, they sell them to Korea, other people will make them. So today is really the... The, the, the industry of the mind and the knowledge is what's facing us. And in that sense, we are also adapting our role. Mm -hmm. So our role in the past is really how to handle the cargo from the time the ship comes to the quay until the cargo leaves the gate. That is the timeline of our revenue. And that's the time for the first uh, part of this session. Okay. <laughs> I have to stop you here and okay. we'll have to take a break. Mushahidina Fasul and Wasl, ibqaw ma'ana.
ما عليكم ممكن نظبط التايه بس للنص بس حتى مشاهدينا اهلا بكم مجددا لازم Welcome back uh, from Davos uh, at this session uh, about Asia's bet on the Middle East. Between Asia and the Middle East in general. Having said that, we all know that Asia is not one Asia. Asia is made of many conflicting powers and has many overlapping agendas. Asia is the Chinese BRI, is the Pakistani economic corridor. Asia is the Japanese technology and Malaysia Islamic banking system. It is also India's partnership in the Gulf and Singapore's role model status. The big question stays about the conflict inside Asia. My question is for Mr. Singh. What are the main challenges facing Asian-Arab relationship internally, if there is any? If I understand it correctly, when you when you say Asian Arab relationship, it is Arab countries versus rest of Asia. Rest of Asia. If that is so, as I said earlier, that uh, energy remained a very very strong bond for tying different parts of Asia. Uh, Arab countries had been providing that, but of late, if we see, there had been few developments in this regard. Also, we have seen U.S. coming as a strong. Uh, producer of oil. I mean, uh, we are going to see a large quantity of U.S. oil also coming in the global market. We are also seeing the other forms of energy coming in a big way. Some geopolitical disturbances within the Arab countries have been impacting and uh, making these oil availability little uncertain. And uh, issues like Iran sanction also had been impacting this. So I think these uh, had been the challenges. But uh, the, there is a plus side of it, uh, of all these issues also. Uh, the plus side is uh, that uh, the Arab countries had been extremely reliable source of energy supplies in spite of uh, all the conflicts. In, in fact, uh, India remains one of the largest, in fact, my company is the largest single buyer of Iraqi crude. Mm -hmm. And during the peak times of Gulf War also, the Iraqi crude supplies were never disrupted. Mm -hmm. So that, that gives us the confidence as far as the supplies of energy are concerned. Now, I strongly believe that uh, rather than delinking energy from uh, other issues, we should use energy as a strong bridge for uh, uh, such tie-ups. Uh, off late, uh, we are seeing that apart from merely supplying the energy, oil and gas particularly, to rest of the Asia, uh, there had been a lot of other positives in terms of opening opportunities for investment uh, like for India in particular, uh, in the upstream section in Gulf countries, uh, whether it is Abu Dhabi or uh, Oman or other countries. Similarly, we are also seeing a lot of investment by the Gulf countries in downstream uh, industry and other industry in, in Asian countries, particularly India. India is seeing a lot of growth in traditional refining and oil business, and uh, we are seeing a lot of investment by Saudi and uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, they are partnering with us in one of the largest projects of uh, refinery in the, uh, in the world today. So these are tie-ups which, uh, which probably not there a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Apart from this, as I said, uh, other technological tie-ups in terms of uh, structured human uh, resources tie-ups, defense tie-ups, uh, a lot of things are happening today, which I'm sure will make the bond stronger. So we provide uh, oil despite the fact that we are a troubled region, uh, but still, what about your countries? Mr. Um, Kitaoka, if I may ask, uh, do you think there is competition over access uh, to energy sources in your region? I, I cannot deny that, uh, uh, that, but actually it is a bit uh, exaggerated. You know, uh, uh, energy is available. From from even the, the, the conflict among the Asian countries on energy import is exaggerated. It can be bond sometimes, and also we can import energy from other uh, countries. Also, the, the shale gas is another source of energy. Atomic energy is also available. Uh, one uh, basic principle, uh, rule of thumb, is that uh, you know it's very difficult to have a very good relations with uh, your neighboring countries. That's mm -hmm. usually the case, okay? And also, uh, Japan and China have somewhat uh, different views <coughs> over the world. 
uh, the uh, Japan is the of the opinion that uh, uh, the world should be uh, supported by international law. And then every country, sovereign country, has to be equal. There should be no intervention, blah, blah, blah. That's why we, Japan is very close to uh, ASEAN countries and India, and then along the coast of the uh, Eurasian continent. Uh, China is a little more China-centered view of the world. That is one of the source of uh, uh, conflict. But actually, the conflicts between Asian countries is uh, usually they are exaggerated. And uh, that's within a... Uh, 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 Let's uh, ask Mr. Twejri if he feels that. Do you sense that there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, aggressiveness between the Asian countries when it comes to uh, the oil sector? Uh, is their, um, uh, their decision are maybe dominated by confrontation or is it a bit ex exaggerated? As uh, I tend to agree, actually. It's more of a bilateral, long-term, steady relationships Talking about the refinery, this is 600,000 barrel uh, refinery done jointly, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and India. I also think because of Asia's challenge around energy, they've actually uh, developed alternative energy solutions, solar, nuclear, uh, and others. And uh, in our part of the world, we're also diversifying our economies away from oil. So I see a natural flow uh, of Asian solutions, China, Japan, nuclear, Korea did in Abu Dhabi, into the Middle East, which will help us ultimately both to grow our economies. Uh, we can do a lot with the money from oil to reinvest back, and they can also promote and transport this, uh, these technologies back to the uh, Middle East. One thing that is clear to us here in Davos, mm -hmm. we celebrated with two Japanese banks opening their banks in Saudi Arabia. So funding, a lot of uh, liquidity is out there chasing zero interest rates, assets, whereas the Middle East provides a significant projects where yield is uh, better, uh, credit rating is excellent, and the know-how is there between the two uh, continents. I think also this flow will help facilitate everything else, uh, projects in infrastructure, projects in water solutions, desalination, and uh, other uh, energy and electricity solutions. That's interesting. Dr. Fouad, uh, um, having Japan and India hand in hand with the Americans in a way uh, on political level and China being on the side and under pressure and knowing that the Americans are on the ground in Iraq, um, any effect from the situation there or their political positions or not? No, I don't think so. You see, it, uh, first, we are forming our policy uh, towards these countries. And um, as we want to have good relationship with the United States, we have good relationship with China and India and Japan, uh, and many Japanese companies and Chinese companies and uh, Indian uh, companies are there. They are there. But, uh, of course, uh, we must not ignore the political side of the issue. I mean, nowadays we are talking about the kind of tension uh, in, uh, between China and the United States. Mm. Uh, that will never affect uh, so, okay. the then with China. We will see, we see China to decide uh, uh, to deal with both of them? Or no, no, no. We decide for ourselves and we decide how to uh, our, exactly our political conduct. But uh, anyhow, this tension between China and the United States um, uh, push China more to be more active in Middle East and uh, among these countries also Iraq. We see uh, almost every day Chinese companies coming uh, to Baghdad and <coughs> trying to invest or establish good relationship with us. It has to do with this tension with the United States, I mean this political uh, dimension because China is heading, was already heading towards Africa but nowadays they are heading towards Middle East, so they are adding Middle East uh, to their, uh, uh, to Africa and their influence. So uh, this is, I don't know if it has to do with this political tension between the United States and America, but it is obvious for us after this tension the Chinese are more active in our area. Okay. Uh, if I may uh, yes. comment on His Excellency, I think it's the technology piece that really matters and the outcome of the negotiation around technology. Because the region, Middle East and Africa, will 
be in a very awkward position if they have to choose ultimately which technology they go with, US or China. <clears throat> Not only is it going to be very expensive, but it's also going to be very hard mm -hmm. to make that decision. So maybe the trade or the bigger picture, they will resolve it probably one way or the other, but that piece is still a big puzzle for the region. Uh, so we're, we're watching really with a big interest uh, how they will end up the discussions. Um, uh, Mr. Sultan, uh, when we talk about Asian, one Asian guy commented that I don't, <coughs> and said, I don't trust us. Do we trust the Asian? And I'll take uh, one example, uh, China, uh, and what is uh, described as the uh, debt trap diplomacy they use. Can you comment on that? <laughs> um, we do business in China, we do business with everybody, and it's not a matter of trust, really. Uh, we see where our business is, there is value for us, there is value for them, and every business, at the end of the day, you make a decision in which way you have. Uh, I think uh, China is a great country, and China is, uh, is a country that has great respect, great civilization, and, the, and how China built their country from 87, when there was nothing until today, it's amazing. In every aspect, including uh, not only in, even environmental, China used to have pollution. There is no pollution. The the issue today with 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 China, with not with China itself, but with the companies. Some of the companies in China uh, created this debt trap, where they overextend loans to countries in the goal of taking over their assets. And it happened in uh, Sri Lanka where they gave them loans they couldn't pay, they took their assets. This practice, uh, I term it like predatory practice, whereby this is not a business practice, a predator will, will, will do this. Uh, now, many Chinese companies are great and we deal with them, we have great respect, but some of them fall in that trap. And that tarnishes China's reputation as a country which really helps and, and contributes to you? others. Hmm? Does it scare you? It concerns us because it happened to us in certain areas, like Djibouti, for example, where they overextended loan they couldn't pay and they ended up uh, confiscating our port because they have to pay. Uh, these kind of practices is not good for the reputation of China. It's unfortunate that some of the Chinese uh, companies practice it. This is not accepted by the government of China. Uh, when, we tea, when we talk to them, they, they don't like what, what's happening. But unfortunately, it tarnishes their reputation. Mr. Singh, why do we have um, Japan uh, and India as friends, but not China? I can't say that because... <laughs> <laughs> well, if we watch the visits I, I, lately... The, the, ex the extent of friendship might differ, but um, we are friends almost with all the countries within Asia. Uh, with Japan, we have different kind of tie-ups, and with China also, I would say that uh, we are open to for business types. There are a lot of Chinese companies which are operating in India today. We source a lot of material from China. Uh, of late, uh, there is a strong drive within India to do make in India. So whatever we can do within India, we want to promote all those uh, things, whether industrial or uh, futuristic also. Uh, but uh, we are absolutely open for uh, all commercial types. Uh, are they, are they open? Do you feel that they are open? <clears throat> yeah, they are definitely open. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mr. Kitao. Yeah, I just wanted to support his remarks. You know, for example, uh, that in China, business practice can be influenced by politics too much. You know, if Philippines, for example, uh, if China finds Philippines a little bit uh, defiant, then they will slow down the process of import of a banana from the Philippines so that they can be <coughs> rotten and of, uh, will become of no use. Then uh, what we are very much willing to do is uh, just a business as business, you know. A business should be conducted as a business practice. So this is something we can do in, with India and with the uh, Arab countries and with most of the countries. But in China, uh, there, there are something, sometimes uh, too much intervention from politics. You know, this country is uh, defiant, so uh, let's punish this country. And also, uh, uh, because I'm an original university professor, I have many uh, scholars in China, and I have very good friends, and I have a very great admiration for Chinese uh, development. But now the scope of uh, freedom for Chinese scholars is uh, limited to minimum. Mm -hmm. they, therefore, I cannot make a telephone call for them, because it is everything is monitored by the government. 
So the, uh, I don't know if uh, they can go on to develop more, but actually I do not like uh, the, the, the scope of uh, freedom of speech, scope of freedom of academic activities uh, is diminishing. I don't uh, know. Dr. Fuad, does it, uh, do we care if they have freedom of speech or uh, anything else when it comes to dealing with the Chinese or any other Asian country? Uh, of course we care. Uh, it, it is about human being. But uh, at the end, when we are talking about the uh, relationship between two countries, then you are talking about the interest between these two. You see, uh, as uh, here has been said, um, when uh, ideology is guiding the uh, trade and when politics is guiding um, the, the relationship, trade relationship, then there is something wrong. But when it is about business and choosing the right things for your country and on the basis of the interests of your country and on the basis of mutual interest, then it's good. But, uh, of course, uh, uh, human rights is an issue that, uh, that's part of uh, our uh, thoughts and our policy. Okay, uh, we'll have to take a break right now. Mushahidina Fasil, Wanwasa. Let us stop now and please remain with us. you want to talk. We'll give you uh, the time later on, don't worry. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we are still here in this special session on the title Asia's Bet on the Middle East. I was planning to continue the discussion, but during the break, I noticed that uh, everybody was trying to make a point. So I'll uh, open the floor for question and answer. Um, who would like to start? Yes, please. Yes. The mic, I'd please. Like One second, sir. One second. About what's happened between uh, could you please introduce yourself first? My name is Hamza al from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I would like to ask you about the situation like we feel it's went out of contest dealing with Mr. Carlos of Nissan and Renault in Japan, which is affecting people to go and uh, to Japan and invest or deal with because it's really out of contest. The case of Carlos Wong? Yeah, Carlos Wong, yes. Well, the, you know, I have one criticism against Japan's uh, uh, justice process. You know, they detain the, the uh, uh, not only Carlos Ghosn, but also many people for, for too many weeks, too many months. But uh, uh, according to the information uh, which is now revealing, uh, it is quite likely that he has committed uh, quite a serious uh, uh, the crime. That's it. Well, at, at the end of the day, the court will decide. Uh, it's mm. about the uh, trust, I think, rather than a certain uh, case. And this, I might ask uh, Mr. Twajri about it. How um, much do we trust the Asian? I think we should also not forget the private sector role, business to business. I mean, the Hyundai's of the world, the Toyotas of the world, and many other Chinese companies who've demonstrated commitment, demonstrated a lot of success uh, stories in the Middle East, and the list is very long, and vice versa. Many of our private sectors in the Middle East have also ventured out to Asia and succeeded. Uh, Aramco is a classic example where they have one of the largest uh, refineries in Korea and in India and in China. So let's not forget that. I think if we want to talk about trust, we should always think long term. Mm -hmm. This is not something we can switch on and off. It will be built on evidence. It must be built on trial and error, it must be built on success rates, and I would uh, depend on the private sector to lead in the future. Our own diversification story will be hopefully private sector, sector led, and many of the Asian countries have also been successful because of a strong private sector. Um, any other question from the audience? Yes, please. 
means Yahya Sarkan from Palestine. On? Yeah. Yahya Sarkan from Palestine. Um, the question I have, uh, do you think, to the panel, of course, democratization and also uh, uh, advanced technology and also modernizations of economies is a factor of building more stronger relationship between the Arab and Middle East regions to the uh, rest of Asia. Would you like to start, sir? I think uh, uh, trade uh, between nations needs an open society. I mean, uh, that means more democratization can lead to better trade relationship between uh, different nations. Uh, at the end, we are talking about private sector also, not only government relationship. And when we are talking about private sector, private sector needs a different atmosphere, a different political atmosphere also, not only uh, 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 economic structure, but it needs different uh, to, uh, political structure to grow uh, and to have good relationship with the outside world. Uh, I think democratization will help. Democratization of the society, uh, rule of law in the society, role of, uh, the role of the woman in the society, youth in the society. I, I mean, all these aspects together can lead to better relationship and to establish a good uh, trade with other countries. Sir. Oh, yes. Uh, let me speak uh, about Indonesia, for example, to, to show the, the meaning of the relationship between democratization and development. Uh, Japan, JICA, has started to assist the Indonesian economy since the uh, 1950s. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, also in the 1960s, uh, we are criticized by the Western countries very much. Why do you support such a dictatorship? Mm -hmm. And we are supporting them with the hope of that they will become rich and by, uh, first of all, by creating infrastructure. And then based on this infrastructure, Japanese businesses went into Indonesia to create export industries. <coughs> and then the economic level went up, and which created the massive middle class. Based on this rise of middle class, there was a democratization took place. Now Indonesia is one of the most democratic countries in East Asia. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And uh, basically, here, yeah, if I may, yes, here we see the um, interaction between uh, growing economy and uh, democratization process. So, I mean, the question in some societies is, uh, are we going to start with democratization process or are we going to start with establishing the middle class so that we can have a good democracy? This is a real question. Mm -hmm. But at the end, uh, if we are talking about future, we need an interaction between the grow, growth of the economy, but also the process of democratization must be there. Yeah, exactly. And basically, uh, a while ago, we were talking a lot about China. And uh, um, let us watch this video that will uh, give us a better understanding of uh, the projects they're doing in the region. Stretching across the globe, this is China's Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road, also known as BRI, was announced by Chinese President Xi Jinping in 2013 and has since been understood as a revival of the ancient Silk Road. An ambitious effort to improve infrastructure, trade and investment between China and some 70 other countries. A grand plan to connect Asia, Africa and Europe. It includes one third of the world trade and GDP and over 60% of the world's population. It is a project made up of a belt overland and corridors and a maritime road of shipping lanes. This is a project expected to transform world economies and improve global connectivity. One belt, one road. Mr. Singh, your uh, country has a uh, good relationship between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, between Israel, and between Iran. How long do you think uh, you can keep um, uh, this relationship uh, balanced? I think 
we had been doing it very well, and uh, each country is different. Each relationship is different. We don't uh, have a relationship at the cost of others. And even the trying times also, our relationship uh, had been there. And um, it's not with a purpose. I think it's for the mutual uh, benefit. It's uh, a mutual relationship. And I strongly believe that uh, they will last. They will last without... Uh, do you have any problem with that in Saudi Arabia? I think ultimately what will prevail is um, credibility and sustainability. Uh, how would we... How are we available uh, for India or any other Asian country when they need us and vice versa? How would the Indian foods and products, goods and products, serve our uh, own um, business model or objectives? Uh, we have a great relationship and it's growing. Mm -hmm. So, You have no problem. What about the United Arab Emirates? DP, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't represent the government. Um, but that will reflect on any agreement you do or uh, also on the work in the ports, etc. Would it affect the relationship with the relationship uh, of India or any other country? With a country that you don't have good relationship with, uh, would it affect any deals? No, I mean, we do our business and uh, we look at each product based on its own merits. So we are a major investor in India. And I tell you, I, I want to say, say something about India. India is one of the countries that is... Uh, the law uh, is applicable. The law and the fairness of the system is available. And I know people just talked about investment, whether there's democracy that's going to increase business. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is the system fair? Is there is law? Is there a really, uh, ability people to abuse the law? Because there are many countries who call and have democratic process, but it's only in paper. In reality, you get abused. Okay. Uh, look at Singapore. There's no opposition and, and uh, party, but it's one of the biggest markets in Asia. Look at China. Is there an opposition party in China? But there is a system that's fair, very fair. In India, I'll give you an, a very interesting example. Uh, when we came to India in 2007, we acquired certain terminals. And the chief minister, the prime minister today was the chief minister of uh, uh, Gujarat, where the port of Mundra. And we applied to all the Indian uh, states that we are going to have a port in your country, in your state. And we gave them permission. He said, I don't accept. You haven't taken my permission. So I went to meet him. He said, no, I know you have the port, but we didn't give you permission. And so he said, you have to leave. And I said, I'm not going to leave. We have a court. And we take it to court. We took it to court. Every time... We win, it's in our favor, and still we didn't get permission, but nobody interfered in our business. He, as the chief minister, he could not influence the law. The judges are appointed from the federal government. Now he's prime minister, and I met with him, and he said, no, you're welcome, I have no problem with you. India is a democracy, not on paper. Nobody can influence the law in India. Now, when you look at India and China, two great countries, with 1.2 billion, roughly, same population. The trading of China is 100 million containers. The trading of India is only 10 million. There's a huge potential for growth in India. And the policies of uh, the prime minister today in opening India, in made in India, in, in, in removing many of the obstacles. Today, India is the fastest in growth. A huge growth and a huge potential to grow. Mm -hmm. And we are very bullish about India and we uh, are investing, invested uh, billions in not only in the port, but in the logistics and the supply chain and a lot of these things. I think what uh, we face in the Middle East, uh, trading agreement that are respected. Uh, what we face, maybe some development in the hard structure and in the soft structure. Each country have their own system of customer clearance. So even though you get a cargo, I'm talking from my position, that could go so fast, you would spend days because of some paperwork. Uh, there need to be improvement of that system. There are countries where we share agreements with that 
helps uh, to smooth the, uh, the, the receiving cargo. However, mm -hmm. that's a different matter at the border. Yeah. There's a lot of potential in the Middle East, but very little inter-countries uh, trade. There'll be trade from outside, but, but inter-trade needs improvement of, course. of soft and hard facilities to improve trade. Uh, well, I have to open the floor for questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Christina Lampi on road. I am a co-chair for World Economic Forum's Future of Energy Council, also a two-time tech pioneer. My question to the panel, and thanks for a very interesting discussion, is how you can collaborate with the rest of the world where you sit on the massive opportunity to be the heroes in the war against climate change. How can we help? Where can you lead? What are your thoughts? Would you like to start? So, again, I think um, that's a very important question. If I take Saudi Arabia as an example, we are fully committed to the Paris Agreement. I think in terms of emission, in terms of carbon dioxide, we're, our oil business is the best in the world, uh, flaring, etc. I think also there is a piece of balance between how do you ensure the world continues to grow, human needs are serviced, while you diversify away into non-fossil fuel alternative energies. And there is also the umbrella of cost. How would that cost? Hence, the investment in technology, the investments in all these solutions. In Saudi Arabia, for example, we're committed to make sure that the energy mix ultimately is non-oil, uh, whether it's solar, wind, or uh, nuclear. Uh, so that said, I think also we have a responsibility uh, for the rest of the world to engage, communicate, and share our data. Because again, data sometimes is misleading. I think we should all, always have even audited data into this so people can see uh, how everybody operates. would like to hear from Dr. Fouad about that. Yes, I think next to the International Climate Agreement, we need a kind of regional climate agreement mm -hmm. because at the end, if we can start with ourselves, we can be a part of this process on international level. So it will be good also to uh, approach this issue among ourselves. I'm talking about, in this case, Middle East, to have a regional agreement so that it can be more effective. Otherwise, to be part of the international agreement is good, but we need issues which is related to each other because uh, it is about uh, the geography which is close to each other yeah. and which is part of the world. Mr. Sang? Let me also share with you a couple of uh, actions which we have taken in India. India remains totally committed to Paris Agreement. And uh, we don't because India is growing fairly fast and our energy requirements are also increasing. We are already a large consumer of energy. We are third largest primary energy consumer in the, country, uh, in the world today. And a uh, couple of large initiatives uh, are, uh, we were on uh, Euro 3 automotive fuels uh, quality and emission standards till 2016. 2017, we switched to Euro 4, and 2020, we are switching to Euro 6. I don't think any other country in the world has switched to Euro 4 to Euro 6 within a span of three years. It's a strong commitment. And uh, another thing is, uh, there is a large population in India which is still rural, and which are still using biomass for cooking purpose. Mm -hmm. We started a scheme which is called Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana, uh, which was launched in May 2016. And since then, in less than three years, 60 million homes have been provided LPG connections, which is, which is a large, large number. Today, 90% of Indian homes mm. have LPG connections. I mean, they have access to absolutely clean cooking fuel. Now, these are uh, something which, which we have achieved and uh, which is significant uh, considering the scale of uh, the issue. Other major steps are we are very aggressive in renewable energy. Our target is to have uh, 175 gigawatt renewable energy generation by 2022. And uh, we are again very strongly working on biofuels and other forms of energy so that uh, we are able to do better than our commitments in Paris. That's really good. Uh, sir, what about Japan? Uh, yeah, Japan took the lead in the case of the Kyoto Protocol. Okay? But in this issue, uh, are, uh, now Japan is a little bit behind 
uh, from other advanced countries, uh, partly because of the uh, Fukushima Daiichi incident, which took the, brought a big damage on Japan's uh, nuclear plant. But uh, now uh, the things are changing. And then last year, in August, I was appointed to be a chair of the uh, economic development strategy within Paris Agreement. And then uh, he will, Prime Minister, by Prime Minister Abe, and Prime Minister Abe will announce uh, Japan's approach in upcoming uh, G20 media. So you can expect what Japan can do. Not only that, uh, Japan is also, particularly JICA, is uh, contributing to the effort of uh, developing countries in all over the world, yeah. particularly the for example, Amazon forestry and the forestry in uh, uh, Congo and many other places. We are assisting uh, those uh, developing countries uh, so that they can commit to this Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. I hope um, those comments an mm -hmm. answered your question. Any other question, please? Would you like to add? No, I, I will add uh, one thing uh, from a business standpoint. A lot of time people, when they look at sustainability and they look at uh, reducing the carbon emission, they think it's going to be a cost. From our experience, we saved a lot of money by converting fossil uh, engines, basically, in our equipment to electric. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. in, in the port, for example, in Jabal Ali, it was imposed on us, actually, in, in England when we did the port. And it was a cost until we realized it's saving us so much money because we don't have any breakage. Uh, we, are, we don't want to worry anymore about the uh, oil prices. So in Jabal Ali, for example, we consume or we need four, 30 megawatts for the buildings mm -hmm. so far we have. We installed solar powers uh, and we produce 40 megawatts. Now, the interesting thing is in solar, if you are on the grid, it's very cheap because you take the power from the sun and you use it immediately. You don't need to store it. At night, we use the government uh, power. So when you want to produce something with solar, almost 80% is the battery to store. Mm -hmm. If you don't need to store, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. We saved a lot of money by utilizing uh, non-fossil uh, you know, fuel and energy. So it's not a cost, it's an advantage. An investment, basically. Yes. Um, any other question? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Yasser Sharif. My question to the uh, panel, how would you perceive the latest opening up in markets between the two largest economies in the Arab world, Saudi Arabia and UAE? Thank you. Uh, look, we, we want to basically uh, build a story of, uh, of hope to the region. Uh, and also we think if Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates cooperate on every sector, we can not only open trade, but also facilitate Asian uh, businesses to the region. Uh, between us, we represent more than 80% of the uh, region's uh, GDP. Uh, and if you think of the Red Sea, for example, and think of logistics, how would the two nations, if they put their act together, and think of a network of logistics uh, between ports, airports, roads, uh, land, etc. How can this help connecting Asia, Europe, and the Middle East? We also, in this cooperation council, we looked at every single opportunity where we optimize. Optimize our financial resources, investments, landscapes, opportunities to invest together. So, in summary, hope for the region, role model, uh, and help the rest of the world through our partnership. Um, how do you receive the message from such uh, cooperation between no, the two countries? Uh, any, any such uh, cooperation which is standing on the strong fundamentals is always welcome. Any comment? Um, anytime there's cooperation, trade increases. Uh, this is something we like as, as a port operator. And in fact, not only between us and Saudi Arabia, but any port we, we operate in, we work so hard to see how we can increase their GDP. Because there is a relation. If the GDP increases in a country by 1%, our business will increase by 3%, three times. 
So when we go to a country, we always do something called port-centric. So I have a port, I have an industrial park, I have to create jobs, I have to improve the purchasing power. Naturally, uh, the relation with Saudi Arabia has improved tremendously, and today we are cooperating a lot. A lot of time, uh, even though with the GCC, they might agree on something, but a lot of time, the customs in any country always create a problem. Yeah. We came with an initiative, actually, I want to share, uh, which is one of the uh, things promoted by the World Customs Organization is something called uh, Authorized Economic uh, Operator, which is basically what's happening between the United States and Canada, for example. Mm -hmm. We did sign it with Korea. We signed with Saudi Arabia Customs, and we're going to implement it. What it is, is even though the country has no economic agreement, it is an agreement between two customs, mm. and we will try to with India. What it does basically is, with Korea, we will nominate the best companies in UAE, the ones who never evaded customer duty, don't have any issue, good financial standing. Uh, their record is clean. They never violated any law, and there's no court uh, case against them, or never did. These will be the best. We, we nominate ours, they nominate theirs, and we treat them a different treatment. Yeah. Their product goes faster, easier, and all that. Uh, so far, if, uh, we have signed with Korea. We, we're going to implement Saudi Arabia. We signed in the beginning, and we're going to do with India. And I, I think that will, will help to move uh, product faster. I, I, we would love to do that. I, I would like to ask you, uh, Doctor, uh, how do you evaluate your relationship with the uh, uh, GCC countries and Arab countries in general? No, our relationship with the Gulf countries is good and we want to improve it. But uh, as it has been said, uh, cooperation is positive. Uh, if we will enlarge that uh, in our area, uh, it will be uh, it will affect our economy positively. You see, we are talking about the relationship between Middle East and other Asian countries. While it is also necessary to discuss matters among Internal ourselves. Yeah. yeah, that's why when I mentioned the climate agreement, so we need also to agree among, among ourselves on other issues. Uh, so uh, Iraq <coughs> has passed the difficult stage. Mm -hmm. The fight uh, against the terrorist state, ISIS, is behind us, although the organization is, also, uh, is still there. And we have got a new government, new vision, new strategy for economy, but also <laughs> new policy towards our neighboring countries mm -hmm. to establish positive, good uh, relationship with all our neighboring countries. And of course, Gulf countries are important partners for us. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you very Thank you. much for your, yes, please, okay. quickly, in one minute. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you promised that I have another time to explain about Japan's approach, uh, particularly on cultural approach. You know, uh, now uh, Egyptian uh, president has shown uh, strong interest in importing Japan, Japan model elementary schools. We are all talking about high technology and so forth. But basic education is also very important. Of course. And then they are starting full effort uh, to import Japan model in which uh, disciplined children can be educated. And this will need another session to discuss. Thank you very much, <laughs> sir. But uh, we ran out of time. And thank you shukran. all for joining us. Thank you. Shukran thank you, dear uh, uh, audience. And see you once more.